Hello, everyone. <laughs> now, somebody in the first service said, with your sling and everything, I just expected you to start singing, I'm a little teapot. <laughs> but I'm not short and stout, so that's not gonna work. The reason why I'm wearing this, though, in case you're wondering, is so that I can remember that there is only so much love that I have to give, only so much talent or ability, I only have so much time, so much money, and it also helps me keep a lid on my joy. <laughs> because, you know, sometimes you meet people that aren't quite as joyful as us Unity folks, and, you know, somebody's feeling down or depressed, you know, I, misery loves company. Oh, I lost my lid, that's good news. <laughs> so the, the thing is that um, this is a common way that we move through the world, right? We keep a lid on our abundance. So I may have a lot of money and think, oh, there are hungry people in the world and somehow it's so nonsensical, but I can, out of my own guilt, then take a lower paying job in order to be with the peeps, right? <laughs> but how does that help anyone? You know, so there's actually this, it doesn't make sense, yet these beliefs are these underpinning core ideas that kind of run the show. Anybody recognize that in their lives sometimes? And we recognize it because we do the shadow work that brings those shadows into the light. And this is our second in the Lumen Shadow series of four weeks where we're breaking out of the shadows, various things. So this week it is lack, the shadow of lack. And there's actually a scientific experiment that helps us prove this belief system. There were a group of scientists that took a, a jar full of fleas. And the fleas would jump right out of the jar, you know, exuberant, abundant fleas, right? As, as you may have experienced them before on the family pet. And, <laughs> and so they, they multiply and they're everywhere. They seem to be extra blessed somehow and extra exuberant. And the scientists put a lid on the jar, and then the fleas would hit the top of the lid and fall back down, which probably didn't feel very good on their little flea heads. And, and so eventually the scientists took the, the lid off because the fleas had learned to jump only so high. And when they took the lid off, the fleas never jumped out of the jar again. Yeah, so pointed lesson, right, <laughs> for us. <laughs> that these ideas, the belief systems, the, the lid that we put on things keeps us small, keeps us in lack and limitation and not enoughness. And, and the Cambridge Dictionary says this idea of putting a lid on something is defined as, as holding control over it, stopping it from increasing. So we wonder why there isn't the love we want in our life or the financial freedom we want in our life or it never seems like there's enough time or whatever it is that we're dreaming of. And we might look, you know, under the lid, <laughs> into the dark pot, see what's going on in there and see what it is that is, is tamping things down, is keeping us small. The Cambridge Dictionary also says keeping a lid on things is keeping things in secret, essentially, from one another. Well, that's not exactly how it says it, but so I'll, I'll tell you in case somebody looks, looks it up. It makes sure that people do not find out something. So keeping a lid on something is to try to make sure people don't find out something. And what is the greatest secret of all beneath the I'm not enough, what is that greater secret, that deeper secret, that thing we, we kind of don't want to reveal to ourselves or anyone else? It's our light, right? Our magnificence, our brilliance. Remember that quote by Marianne Williamson, out of the Course, or inspired by the Course in Miracles? It is our light that we most fear, not so much our darkness, and that we serve no one by playing small. Yet we constantly teach our children and one another to keep a lid on it, to put a lid on it, to tamp it down, to control things, to stop things from increasing, right? So in some ways, somehow, we have all agreed to that. And so there is this sort of collective shadow process 
that needs to be unveiled. Lynn Twist is one of my favorite abundance teachers. She's, um, she speaks of abundance in terms of sufficiency. And that's why I really like the twist, so to speak, on that. She, it, her, her first book that, um, I think it, it might be her only one, so, The Soul of Money, is the, is the one where I first heard these, what she called toxic scarcity myths. And essentially, we bring, we illumine or bring from the shadows into the light these ideas, in other, ways, in other words, into our conscious awareness, we bring forth these ideas of scarcity, these ideas of limitation that are toxic for us all, yet somehow collectively they kind of run through things. And so this, the work of the shadow is so important because it says, aha, there you are. You know, it's like when you have some deep, dark secret and you tell your best friend and then it's out there and it's like, oh. Do you ever notice that like big exhale, that feeling? Like, wow, okay, now it's out there, somebody knows. And then maybe somebody else knows. And pretty soon the sting is out of it, the shame is out of it, the guilt is out of it. And it just is what it is. An opportunity to learn, an opportunity to grow, an opportunity to transform, to decide what we want to do with that thing. So Lynn's three toxic scarcity myths that she outlines in this, this book, The Soul of Money, are there's not enough. We know that one well, right? That sort of describes lack in and of itself. And more is better, which is kind of a shade of there's not enough, but we know that in our culture, right? That there is this, this wheel of more is better. And that's just the way it is. That's just the way it is. So when we live under these scarcity myths, this is sort of what it looks like to live in that realm. There's a slide or a slide. A slide or a slide. <laughs> that's, that's what it looks like, right? When we're living in scarcity. Because we get in that realm and that consciousness and that way of being and then everything sort of feels like it's scary or or it's, it's almost like there's, there's both spectrums, right? We're afraid of our failure and we're afraid of our success. We're afraid of the darkness and we're afraid of the light. We're afraid we're not enough and we're afraid we're too much. You know, because we want to belong, because we want to have that sense of community. When I was doing some prosperity work years ago, it was a big aha to me to realize, because I was affirming, I'm generous and wealthy. And I, you know, the generosity was really what was allowing me to claim I'm wealthy. Because it was like, oh, okay, well, if I'm generous, then I can be wealthy, right? And so that was part of it, part of what got me to that place of being able to really claim this fully. But I realized there was something sticking there. And what was sticking there was a fear that if I become really wealthy, I mean, if this really happens, because this stuff works, right? When we work it, it works. So this really happens, if this really gets unveiled and I become really wealthy, who will my friends be? You know, my peeps aren't generally super wealthy, or hadn't been up until now, up until then. <laughs> and so it was that fear of not belonging anymore. Where will I belong? And so we, we create these whole ideologies and belief systems, and then they get all connected to one another, and then it, it means our family, and it means our community, and it means our well-being, and wow, that's too much to, to give over, right? So there's all that kind of running in this process. So this is why this is so rich to, to cast some light so that we can go, oh, to lift up the lid and look in the pot and go, oh, that's what I'm keeping the lid on. That's pretty fantastic stuff that's cooking in there. I think I will take the lid off and might even try it, might even allow myself to become that which I really came here to be. So let's break down these myths a little bit. So there's this guy, he was praying to God, and he was having that kind of conversational prayer going on. And so he says, um, hey, God. God says, yes. He says, can I ask a question? God says, sure. And he says, how much is a mil, uh, how much, oh, wait. I don't even have it with me. Okay, so we'll just, I'll get it. Um, how much is a million years? And God says, 
To me, it's a second. And he says, thanks for a minute. How much is a million dollars then? Eh, to me, it's a penny, God says. Oh, hey, God, could I have a penny? <laughs> and God says, sure, just wait a second. And there we are. <laughs> Always in that game, right? The thing about there's not enough is that underneath it is the I am not enough, right? There's not enough and I'm not enough. And so then we bring, that's the piece that has that sort of the darker piece, the, the, sh the more shameful piece. But yet, what do we know in our teachings about the truth of who we are? We know that we were born of original virtue, right? That's something that unity has been saying for some time. And you know who coined original blessing, that we are born of original blessing? Matthew Fox, who's coming here in a few weeks. Very exciting, right? March 24th, he'll be here for um, services and a workshop. And Matthew Fox and unity have talked about this idea that we were born of original blessing or original virtue versus the old idea that we were born of original sin. And it turns the whole paradigm on its side, doesn't it? I mean, it's this, this is the kind of the key, the essence of all of this, is that remembering the truth of who we are and not fearing it, but allowing it to be, and maybe we just allow one light beam at a time to come through so that we can feel safe about that. Uh, allowing ourselves to move at the pace in which the slowest part of us feels safe to go. You know, it's okay to do that because this more is better and faster. The second one, you know, kind of catches up with us and we must become faster and faster, right? We need to get enlightened or we need to, to you know, open up the way or we need to serve more. Or we need to, you know, whatever it is that is the more or better of chant of your life or of your world. <laughs> We are all familiar with it, right? So that second one also get up, gets us kind of in that frenzy. You know, uh, Brene Brown talks about, she's a social researcher, I've talked about her before, and Brene says that we get in this mode of hustling for our worth. Anybody ever hustle for their worth? <laughs> yeah, so if I do more, or if I'm just a little better, if I just do a little more, if a little better, then I can, you know, deserve or I, I, I can show my worth or maybe I'll be worthy of more appreciation or recognition or love or whatever it is that we're craving. So we get on that circuit of more is better, but if we just illuminate it for a moment, pause for a moment, look at it and realize, huh, not necessarily, right? More is not necessarily better. This week I was introduced to, um, it's called, uh, Boy, I'm having moments here, so thanks for being with me. Um, Kon, Konmari, Konmari. And it's a um, Japanese method. And there's a woman named Marie Kondo who practices it. And apparently she's got all kinds of programs out. This is all news to me. You're all nodding. <laughs> Last one on the block to know. <laughs> so she does this thing called tidying up. So anyway, I learned all this from the women who go to Qigong. Uh, during the week and then they came to our, our noon meditation and, and we were chatting afterwards. So it was this lovely awakening. So I started watching some of this, this idea, which is fabulous. And so the basic idea is, is the process of decluttering stuff, right? But it's, there's a deeper thing to it because what she does is she says, ask each, you know, pick up everything that you have when you use it with reverence and, and ask, does this spark joy? And if it doesn't spark joy, then it's not for you anymore. Now here's where we get into a little bit of the quandary of more is better in our collective. If you throw it away, where is a way? That's what Julia Butterfly Hill, the environmentalist said. So I'm beginning to wonder if maybe, I mean, we could just do this on our own, we could choose on our own because it's not just the way it is, right? That, 
that myth. It's just the way it is. Well, we know the truth underneath that is we do have the power to make change, and we do have the power to make choices. And so it isn't just the way it is that we need to be consumers who throw things away, who fill landfills and seas. It doesn't have to be that way. It, up until now, it has been the trend. But it doesn't have to be that way because we can make different choices. Because we do have the power, and it isn't just the way it is, it's the way it was. It was the way it was until we shone a light on the shadow that made us realize that sufficient abundance is sufficient. More is not necessarily better in terms of stuff, right? So if you have doubted for any moment that you don't have enough, I want to challenge you to go home and open up your closet or a drawer or the garage or a shed or the kitchen cabinet or the junk drawer, best of all. <laughs> and look at how much you have. That is just a physical representation of the infinite gifts that you have. And when you do, as Marie Kondo is suggesting, clear some of that stuff out, you clear the way for spirit to move in your life. You open up the pathways of abundance. So what I was getting at before is I, I wonder if, you know, if, if we don't wake up to the shadow that has now been, you know, has been illumined for us for some time now and, and begin to do something different with it, maybe there will become, we'll have to at some point make a law of the land that we no longer make anything. Like we can't manufacture anything with the Earth's resources anymore. Done, right? So if we just said, okay, done, we're done making, we're done creating, the only, what we can do though, is we can recreate, we can take what is here and we can recycle, reuse, remake, recreate from those materials. I mean, we'd have more than enough forever, right? Because we already have more than enough. We already know that we already have more than enough. And so if we just challenged ourselves individually, to begin to do that, instead, of it, or, or where we purchase things, we purchase things with that complete alignment with our values, you know? So I'm only going to do this with whatever, this artisan or, you know, how this, you know, knowing how this was made and how it, you know, whatever it is, that it's, your, it's your game. It's, it, it's your, you know, um, work with these shadows in your own way. But how we choose then, instead of this is just how it is, that's the way it is. This, is, this is how it is now for me as a divine being. This is how it is for me who understands the sufficiency of great abundance, who understands what it's like to be enough, because that's really what it's all about, that I am enough. I am enough. Not even, I, I was tempted just to say more than enough. I'm not even going there. I'm enough, right? It's a complete sentence, right? It feels really whole and complete, doesn't it? And it, like, it reminds me of Daniel Neymar's song, you know? If this is the last song, you know? What if this is it? What if it's enough? <laughs> what if there isn't anything more to do or to chase, but just to be with what is? And then when we do, we begin to do, like Marie Kondo, just to see how sacred everything is. Like then you pick up a piece of paper and you realize you're holding a tree. You know, I mean, it, it comes to that kind of consciousness when we slow it down a little bit. And that's really abundance. That's abundance. Because it's that deep reverence that brings up that overflowing gratitude. And where else would we want to dwell but there, right? It's a beautiful thing to become aware of that which is holding us back from the truth of who we are. So there's two key unity principles and practices that I think are really useful for us to apply in this idea of moving, illuminating lack and moving to full abundance. And they're simple practices. You've heard about them all of your spiritual life, which is all of your life. Um, and probably all the time you've been in, in um, New Thought and, and before that, other places and other churches or other communities. One is the key practice that we hold in unity, part of our fourth principle, which is meditation. 
Now, I know you're all kind of going, oh, yeah, that one. No, you're not all doing that. Some of you might be doing that. <laughs> and, and so it's not, um, it's not about, oh, I should be doing that, or I need to be doing that, or I never have enough time for that. This is all it takes. This is meditation. <sighs> wow. I feel a lot more expanded centered, open, ready, that's all it takes. Didn't take a lot of time, did it? So it is in that place, that kind of practice, that kind of moving in that, into the spirit that we are, that everything expands. This is this like a really cool thing about meditation is a lot of times people don't do it because they don't think they have enough time but when you do it you realize you actually make time it like creates time now the whole thing of time is just a man-made concept of course but it creates time by moving us into that expanded space and we are so much not only more efficient but more effective when we practice like that periodically so even if you say, well, I don't have a practice or I've fallen away from my practice, could you take up the one minute a day practice? If we all took up the one minute a day practice, or if you've already got a practice and you added one minute to your day, perhaps, or you do something to shift it a little bit, it doesn't have to be added, um, there's, there's a sense of that that infinite abundance that opens up for us. It opens up the mind. And besides all the benefits of peace and clarity and insight and guidance that it offers us, it also opens up this idea that there's not enough time and shifts us into the abundance, infinite space and time. The second practice is tithing. Okay, I'm making everybody like kind of suck their breath in today. <laughs> Maybe, some of you, again. Um, so tithing is giving 10% of your income to where you are spiritually fed. It's, a, it's an ancient practice, an ancient law. In fact, out of Malachi comes this, this charge where in, in the words of God, it says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse and put me to the test, says the Lord and see if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour out for you an overflowing blessing. Put it to the test. Give it a try, it says. Just open it up. And so what's this idea behind it? The idea behind it is that we, as we receive, we give to where we are spiritually fed because we are demonstrating this very practical way that, that my spirituality matters to me most. That my spiritual growth, that the divine in me, the God, the spirit, that whatever you call the great I am, the great spirit, whatever that is for you, that that matters to you more than anything because you have come to understand that when you ground yourself there, when you prioritize there, when that becomes the most important thing in your life, everything else flows from there. Everything else clicks from there, right? Anybody found that to be true when you prioritize in that way? So that's what tithing is about. It's like taking something practical and tangible. And I know money's got like all kinds of crazy energies that it's been put in. Talk about shadow. We could talk about that all day, right? How we have created shadows with money. But what is money? It's just, it's just well, it, literally, it's just paper and coins. But, but it, spiritually, it's energy. It's just a tool, it's energy. So it's a challenge to ask ourselves, how will I prioritize my energy? Where do I wanna invest my energy? So we're really saying, how do I wanna invest my energy and how do I wanna use my time? And I want those things to match up with the things that matter most to me. And so if we just use those two practices, we will create more of what we want, more of the time to do the things we want, and more of the money that the resources that we want to do and be the things that we want to do and be. I told some of you this story that when I went to Silent Unity, um, I actually applied to ministerial school and they sent me a no thank you letter the first time. 
And um, that wasn't the reply I wanted, but it was okay because I totally understood. I was really pretty green and new to it all, and I had been a YOU sponsor and taught a class, I think, but I hadn't had a lot of experience or not a very long-term experience at my Unity Church. And so they were basically saying, we want you to have more experience, more volunteering, more leadership, so on. So, you know, I could have really dwelled in, I'm not enough, or this isn't enough, but I kind of just took it to, okay, so what, so what now? Because I really feel guided to Kansas City, and I was living in Chicago. But I realized that really what I was feeling guided to was silent unity. Like the idea of going and praying with people all day and le really learning to pray and really grounding myself in that kind of energy, that was really lighting my fire. So I went ahead and went. I quit my job and, and, and went, and then, and then I was having the, oh, what have I just done moment. Anybody ever do that? You know, now here I am, I'm on Kansas City soil, I've got this little apartment, you know, and I've said yes to this, you know, hourly job, and I'm living here, you know, not knowing anybody, and I'm walking my new puppy, Hazel the Hairy Mystic, <laughs> and I'm thinking about this in a there's not enough way, right? I'm not gonna have enough money. I mean, I've gone from this big, sh you know, I've taken a big shift, a, 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 you know, a literal a physical pay cut, and how's it gonna work out for me, you know? And so what have, you know, what have I done? And then I see this shiny object, and, and I go and pick it up, and on one side, it has a picture of an eagle, and it says, freedom. Oh, wow, well, that was interesting, like freedom, just manna from heaven. But the best part was the other side. When I turned the coin over, it said, no cash value. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes we really get those signs at the right time and the right place. And sometimes we really need more of the physical experience, you know, that kind of tangible sign. And I, I could really use that at that time. So I really held, I've kept, I probably still have that. I see, I don't even know if I still have it because that's the thing, right? I haven't done the tidying up that Marie Kondo <laughs> is suggesting. Because if we did, we'd know what we have, right? And I would actually keep it because it sparks joy for me because it reminds me of the truth of who I am and to say yes over and over again to those little spiritual nudges that we get along the way because that is living abundance. I never felt more prosperous than when I worked at Silent Unity. Well, I don't wanna, I'm gonna keep feeling more prosperous, but up until then, I hadn't felt that prosperous. And it really surprised me when I'd get my small paycheck and it didn't, that had nothing to do with it. it had nothing to do with it. It was the joy and the service and the prayerful energy and the idea of working at Silent Unity. It was a really big deal to me. Like it was the mothership, right? I got to be in the mothership where Myrtle Fillmore started the heart and soul of our ministry, this affirmative prayer and be steeped in that and hear that cadence of prayer all day long. I loved that. And so I felt so prosperous in every way. And so that's really what we're after, is that feeling, right? The energy, the feeling, the juice that reminds us of who we are. And, and we know that we are in the right place at the right time doing exactly what we've come to be and to do. And if things feel a little off, then we just go, hey, what's that lid? What's, you know, what's going on in there? Oh, and then we realize there might be something in there that's of interest to us. And so I want to invite a volunteer forward who might want to see what's of interest in the pot and um, who might be, um, I don't know, willing just to play a little bit with abundance. Come on, Laura. <laughs> Are you ready to take the lid off your abundance? Yeah? Come, come stand in the middle. Okay, this is it. You're taking the lid off. Lack and limitation is going to move away. And what's inside? <laughs> Would you like that? Just a symbol of your wealth and abundance. This is so, this is so funny because I have a thing with... Um, with $100 like increments over the last couple of days. So wow.
really Wow. <laughs> For you online, she said she has a thing about $100 increments that keep coming to her in the last few days. So right on time. <laughs> Wait, there's more. There's more. So I'm going to invite you to tithe on your $100. So that would mean giving $10 away mm -hmm. to where you're spiritually fed, giving very consciously to, to a place or person with whom you feel spiritually fed by. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then, there's more. Mm -hmm. The remainder, the 90, I really want to ask you to be very conscious about that. Mm -hmm. Like, how, whatever you choose is fine. Whether you choose to share it or bank it or store it in some way or give it away or invest it in something you really care about, just to, to be really conscious about it. And then if you'll email me sometime this week and let me know how it's going for you, like what any abundance ahas or lack ahas or whatever. And then finally, I would appreciate it if I need, I need a microphone for Laura so that people online can hear her. Um, your brave soul, thank you for coming up not knowing what you were getting into. <laughs> so I don't know if you realize, but there is an affirmation on, um, on that bill. And I wondered if you would read it to everybody. It's on every American bill. I think it's on the other side, on the bottom, or on the top. In God we trust. Yeah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so... Um, so we take that prayer with us. Every time we give or receive cash, you can do it with checks, you can do it with electronic transfers, put in your memo line on your electronic transfer or on your check, in God we trust, or God is my source, or thank you God for this gift. And we bring that consciousness into the world, the blessing and the multiplying of our good that we affirm every week. Thank you. Yeah, look forward to seeing what happens. So are the rest of you ready to take the lid off? Let's take the lid off this lack and limitation. Let's throw that off and allow ourselves to be the super fleas we've come here to be. Let's speak this together. Let's speak our knowing together. I'm taking the lid off my abundant self. I have enough. I am enough, I am free, so it is.